So much has went down. So let's just get started. The Alpha of Dragonflight. Well, this week's Alpha brings with it a brand new zone, the Waking Shores, as well as a new dungeon, the Ruby Life Pools. Also, the first iteration of the revamped Mage Talent Tree, and most of the Paladin ones, minus Holy, then two revamped professions, Jewel Crafting and Leather Working, plus a big update to Dragon Riding. Uh, so yeah, compared to last week, this is a pretty juicy build and there was a lot to see. Now, right as you land on the waking shores of the Dragon Isles, you're pretty much slapped with this Jade Forest meets Gorgrond on steroids kind of vibe, complete with, of course, all of the modern, you know, tech, the high fidelity art that we've, of course, became used to with the art team over the last few expansions. Honestly, it's kind of amazing. It's a big, vast return to core Warcraft. And I've been streaming um, live in this channel I mean, that people keep on talking about the zones like every time I've, I've been doing them, and this one certainly deserves it. The Waking Shores makes a excellent first impression of Dragonflight's world. It's just that combination of amazing art and uh, honestly, pretty compelling uh, story. Pretty damn strong. There's also, by the way, a rock climbing quest, which we've later found out from Josh Augustine actually is uh, basically at this stage impossible to fail because it's the tutorial, but uh, I assume then there will be more rock climbing to do where it's actually, you know, you can fail. And there's also stuff where you basically do Pokemon Snap on a raft, which is just neat, right? Like, I know it doesn't matter to a lot of people, but I think it's cool. Uh, the rock climbing can get you super high too, so that will pair pretty damn well with riding. Also, riding! It has weight now. Uh, you can no longer just do a 180 and a dime. Yeah, the mount doesn't instantly follow your mouse. It actually has some momentum. This does mean, effectively, you, you, know, you, you have to turn like a thing that's flying instead of just, you know, go like that. So it does feel significantly more like you're flying a dragon. And that absolutely makes the likes of the time trials harder and I think more enjoyable. I had fun just trying to do the same one over and over again to get a better time. So the feeling of momentum works when you are turning, but I will say it feels a good bit less responsive when you are pulling up or whenever you're diving. So I think those they should try to make a bit more responsive. Um, I understand, um, obviously, you know, why they're adding a little bit of weight to that. I think maybe just uh, for that vertical stuff, maybe a little bit less. Um, but yeah, I think they will be able to fine-tune this so that, you know, there there is enough of a skill cap. Uh, or, you know, like th there is enough skill, basically, involved, because you've got to think about how this dragon literally moves. Um, but obviously, you don't want to do too much of that, because it'll end up feeling kind of clunky and that sort of thing. And uh, one of the things that World of Warcraft has always been renowned for is very snappy controls, which is quite tricky to get if you also want bunch of weightiness. It's a really hard thing to get both of those. Uh, I should kind of know. We totally fucked up our first game project because we tried to make something be really weighty and impactful, and uh, it was bloody hard to make that fun. Okay, Mage and Pals and then, they are in, and with Mage, there's generally been feedback about where abilities are being placed in the tree, and they're basically just being a few too many filler talents. I think it's kind of clear that there'll need to be more work in that one. I've yet to like properly jump in though, so I'll, I'll leave that for now. But we do have experienced paladins on our team, so for the paladins, they're decent, but with a few disappointments. Um, certainly, uh, you know, if you're prot, your, your shield no longer generates holy power, and I think that felt a bit weird to people. But anyway, with rat, there's uh, quite the potential for uh, quite a few different builds, but it still seems like there's going to be a single target build and an AoE build and not a lot of overlap. Now, Rat is also not getting any big new buffs or debuffs like a few other specs have, so that, paired with having to kind of choose between single target and AoE, means there's a few viability fears. But that being said, there's also some new and interesting sounding abilities and builds. Like, there's one that's very consecration focused, that makes consecration feel like less of a filler ability. There's then Path of Ruin, it's a new optional replacement for Wake of Ashes that functions as a spender rather than as a builder, on a much shorter CD as well, with practically the same damage and effects as Wake. Now, of course, without the holy power generation of Wake, uh, you'll maybe need to pick up some more holy power generation through your other talents because you want to reduce your downtime and smooth out your rotation. Then, 
there is a promising and fun sounding AoE consecration build, which, uh, I mean, it's quite something. So, Consecrated Blade makes your Art of War, Proct Blade of Justice, also put a consecration on that target, but that consecration is separate from your main consecration, meaning you can have two consecrations up at once. And Cam Before the Storm makes targets hit by your Divine Storm take more damage from, uh, you guessed it, consecration. Sanctification makes periodic damage from consecration have a chance to generate holy power. Hallowed Ground gives it a flat 10% uh, damage increase too. Incandescence makes each holy power that you spend have a slight chance at making consecration pulse for medium holy damage to five targets within it. So you can see how there's just a big old feedback loop of consecrations there. And that's a good example of a new possibility being opened up. But I imagine that ultimately people will have a single target and an AoE build saved and that'll be that. As it kind of always has been for talents, let's be real. The dungeon then. On the face of it, the Ruby Life Bulls dungeon is short and sweet. It's got uh, beautiful visuals. It's got really cool bosses. And uh, while we've not seen the rest of the dungeons just yet, this is one that is shaping up to perhaps be a bit more like the Mists of Tyrannus Scythe of this expansion. Only three bosses, pretty clear, or pretty short uh, clear time, which uh, probably means it will be a favorite to fill up the Great Vault. And certainly from talking to uh, you know, guys in the team, uh, this is one that I think is being significantly more positively received than the previous two dungeons they tested. Well, in addition to the revelation last week that Hearthstone's Rafam would be making uh, their way into Dragonflight, in addition to both Reno Jackson and Finley Mergleton uh, receiving updates, yet more Hearthstone characters are being spotted on the Dragon Isles. This is kind of neat. So after we land on the waking shores and make our way to uh, the, you know, the first expedition camp, we come across an NPC called Cariel Rome. And that may just seem like a random name of some random NPC to most players who are wholly unaware, uh, but to those who are aware, it's kind of a big deal because she previously has been unique to Hearthstone, a character that has never existed inside World of Warcraft. Hearthstone really has an almost never-ending plethora of really cool, interesting, lore-rich, and core Warcraft-feeling characters that are just unique and fun, right? So I think with Blizzard adding increasingly more characters over from Hearthstone to WoW, it, uh, it feels like they're adding some of the Warcraft into World of Warcraft, which is nice. You know, much of the community, including us, have been uh, kind of saying for the longest time that Hearthstone is where the soul of World of Warcraft was at. It especially felt like that at a time where Shadowlands was doing its thing. But thankfully, with 9.2.5 and a bunch of what we've seen from Dragonflight so far, uh, Warcraft, or World of Warcraft feels more Warcrafty, and that's a good thing. <laughs> so, if these additions continue throughout Dragonflight and beyond, then we actually could be in for some great uh, brand new lore, some fun new characters. Now, of course, I am assuming here that that means that their Hearthstone appearances, they're only like in the Hearthstone canon, and I'm sure that their backstories will share loads of the same details, but Hearthstone, of course, is way more crazy. You know, the, the mean streets of Gadgeta, and that's a, that's a bit of a what if, right? So I doubt that the Hearthstone appearances will be canon, but who those characters are, I mean, they, they should still act how they act, right? So it'll just be new stuff and wow. I think that means they can use Hearthstone as a fun ground for experimentation and creating some characters. And the winners can, I guess, make it over to the big main game, which is neat. There's been quite a bit of discussion as to who is representing the green dragons in this new artwork that was datamined in the most recent Dragonflight Alpha build. The question is, is it Marithra, the daughter of Ysera and current uh, sort of de facto leader of the Green Dragonflight, or is it Ysera, somehow back from Ardenweald? There are many similarities and a few differences between who is represented in the, uh, the dragon artwork and Ysera, so let's, uh, let's just examine this. The similarities then. The facial markings around the eyes, uh, hairstyle, horn style, and moon diadem are very similar, if not identical, to those seen on Yazera's model and artwork. So, that feels conclusive. Uh, the only aspect, though, that is noticeably different to Yazera is the armor. She is wearing a much more simple white robe, reminiscent of the Moon Priestesses and Taronda's attire, and uh, shoulder armor that is very different from the usual uh, green ensemble that Yazera wears. 
It also, though, does greatly differ from Marithra's garb, so ugh, who knows? Now, moving on to potentially more evidence in favor of this actually being Yazera, there's a total of seven new entries in the creature database for Yazera so far in Dragonflight Alpha, and uh, only, well, one of them seemingly is an uprise of her dragon form. But also, there's been about a total of 30 new entries for Marithra in the same creature database. And if all of that wasn't enough, two new weapons have been spotted in the game files as well, seemingly named after Yazera. It's called Knife 1H Yazera and Offhand 1H Yazera. So, I don't know, does that mean Yazera could actually make her way back to the realm of the living somehow in Dragonflight? Maybe through the Will of a Loon or via, as she put it, at the end of Shadowlands, Great Sacrifice. Who knows? Maybe they've just revamped Marithra's model to kind of resemble Yazera a bit more and sort of homage to her mother, right? Maybe she... Uh, who knows, basically. But uh, this is a convenient lead-in to some Loon story. Found early on in the Dragonflight Alpha data mining cycle a few weeks back, there were these new moon textures. One for the larger white lady moon, and another one for the smaller blue child. So could these play a part in a new loon based story in Dragonflight? Well, perhaps the two will meet again in a very rare and special Embrace event, as is a thing in the lore. Maybe it's something that's tied to the Winter Queen's gift being planted in Azeroth, perhaps? Maybe it's Yuzara being lifted up from Ardenweald and back into life? Who knows? But in addition to the moon textures, there's also some interesting weapons that have been data mined too. Two one-handed swords named Alun's Wrath and Alun's Fury. We haven't actually got the literal models though, just tooltips, so to be honest we're all just kind of unsure of what these are even going to look like or how you're going to obtain them. Now, of course, you might remember the lore content we made earlier on this year, or perhaps it was the end of last year. Who knows? What is time anymore? Uh, but we were talking about, you know, the, I mean, the blue child, uh, the white lady, all that stuff. Um, we were talking about the Eyes of the Earth Mother, a short story, taking a mythological interpretation of that. And perhaps it seems the Blizzard are working something of these two celestial bodies in. Uh, maybe that shows us that they plan to sort of continue along those lines. Which, I mean, in fairness, would be good, because I think the best way for them to explore lore that happens off-planet is through the mythology of Azeroth's inhabitants. That's how you make it feel grounded and feel core of Warcraft. You know, not cold readouts from machines. They have their place, but, I don't know, personally, I prefer it in an ancient Tauren story. Season 4. We have got Season 4 news. This time it is uh, really... Many of the questions that you may have. Let's do them. Conduits. No new ranks. They are as is. You will not have to bother earning them again. And uh, what's more, the 282 item level conduit upgrade item uh, can be purchased with Cosmic Flux in the new season, and it requires zero of the achievements. So basically, conduits sorted. Legendaries? You don't need to worry. They're not getting a new rank, and they, I believe, are cheaper based on all the other changes Blizzard made in the past. As for currencies, Cosmic Flux will not reset for the season, Sandworn Relics will become Bind on account, and Great Vault tokens will return, but Sockets will cost 3 instead of 6 because the season will be shorter. What of gameplay then? Well, Keys will be decaying 3 levels for the season, and the end of dungeon items will not be capped for week 1. And for the Raiders, you can jump into Mythic on day 1, with Cross Realm being open from the start. Raids actually drop up to 2,000 Cosmic Flux, and uh, Nathria and Sanctum will give rep with the Court of Harvesters and Death's Advance, uh, respectively. And gear from the Faded Raids, of course, works with the Creation Catalyst, and it can be upgraded to Heroic or Mythic using the new item-level upgrade items that we covered a while back that are being added for this season. Finally then, the Sylvanas Legendary Bow can uh, not be purchased with Dinars, which is that new deterministic currency system that we also covered um, a little while ago for Season 4. It's another new experiment Blizzard are doing. But uh, it and the Edge of Night weapons are going to have a higher drop rate. Blizzard also are doing a balance pass on uh, trinkets and weapons. I believe the inscrutable quantum device is finally being looked at. So that's that. Who knows? Look, there's a part of me that wants to hop in and try things out, maybe even a few alts, because, as I talked about in stream a while ago, 
man, I used to be all about having one of every class and playing them all and really trying to have that knowledge of everything. And I, I logged in and looked at Paladin Talents uh, a little while ago, and I thought, oh, God, I've got nothing to say about this. And I realized I haven't properly played a Paladin in, in years because, well, just with the alt unfriendliness and everything, I've, I've just played, like... One character at a time. I've played like two specs with the whole of Shadowlands. I'm crusty. I'm rusty. But that said, I can also feel the pull of Wrath Classic. So I guess, uh, what will you do? Anyway, there you have it. Lots going on. And so far, so good, to be honest. But as I said last week, it's going to be when we finally see Endgame and what the non-instanced content of the expansion looks like at Endgame that we'll really get a good feel for what this is going to have to offer. You know that how they handle gearing, things like that. But still, I will be lying to you if I said that I'm not enjoying this period of good news. I absolutely am. It is refreshing, and hopefully it's the sort of thing that's actually going to continue. Also, by the way, quick little bump for a Patreon. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's June, of, or sorry, it's not June. It's July. It's almost the end of July, in fact, which does mean it's the end of Machinist Month, and, uh, I have a fair uh, idea, a lot of you will probably like to get the Axolotl pin. The Axolotl pin is really, oh man, it's beautiful. And uh, we swapped them all over to having hard enamel, I think they're coming out beautifully. And uh, I guess the other update, uh, this pin actually came in a batch of four months worth of pins. Which uh, essentially means that uh, really within a week we should be 100% caught up on everything for Patreon. Um, now that said, it could take from that point a week or two for everything to reach, but, uh, yeah, suffice to say, like, 1,500 to 2,000 packages will be leaving the Fulfillment Center, uh, somewhere in England, uh, I believe. Uh, we basically have got to get the many hundreds of these, QC them, which is going to be an all-hands-on-deck situation, likely Monday coming, and, uh, yeah, once that's done, we wrap them all up, we send them to the distribution center, and then, BAM! get everything processed. Not gonna lie, it was definitely, we, we've had uh, big old logistical challenges, and uh, thankfully, with this shipment, all our stuff is actually with us, and we are, well, we're not on schedule yet. I mean, we're on schedule in terms of we have all the things, but we'll be on schedule of fulfillment uh, pretty damn soon. So, there you go. Oh boy. Digital things easy, physical things hard. You learn that the hard way. Anyway, if you want to support us on Patreon, of course, uh, get all the awesome loot like the pins that our Game Studios art team are putting together. Of course, you know where to go, link down below. Anyway, have a brilliant week. I'll see you next time.